for you. Thank you for your love, prayer, faithful financial giving this week, support. We appreciate you. We love you. Thank God for you. We stand with you. We're believing God that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God as we study. You'll grow in grace and in knowledge and that we're growing together. And I encourage you as well. Take a stand on healing right now. It's allergy season right now. All this hay fever, all this pollen's coming out. And uh, we know that it's not allergy season for us. It is healing season. I live in healing season and I expect to be well every day of my life. I don't have to be well tomorrow. I don't even have to believe anything about tomorrow. All I need to do is believe, God, I'm healed right now. So be encouraged and study with us this morning. And God bless you. Thank you for your help and your support. We are going to uh, James chapter 5. And we did pass out an outline this morning. So if you have accessibility and for you that are tuning in, we do not have the projector. Our projector is not working, and so therefore there will be no notes. And I, but I'm assuming they can put the notes on the Internet, so you should be able to find them on Facebook. But uh, the projector is not working, so we don't have notes except by hand here in the auditorium. All right, with God's help, let's go to the book of James chapter 5. James chapter 5. And again, these are some encouraging words that we will draw from and drink from. Now, we've dealt with the rich man. Last week I showed you that God deals with you in love. And as you learn to deal with people the way God deals with you, you will experience great blessing. People oftentimes are your greatest test, trial, and tribulation. People can be extremely aggravating, frustrating, argumentative, difficult. Adversity comes through people. So that being said, God deals with me, and I deal with people. God loves me, I love people. God blesses me, I bless people. God forgives me, I forgive people. Now, if I go this route, which is what most people do, if I deal with people apart from God, then God will deal with me as I've dealt with people. And you'll find that in Matthew 18, 21 through 35. The man that received great forgiveness from the king went out and took his servant or his brother by the throat and wouldn't forgive him. And the king demanded that the servant be turned over to the tormentors until the debt be paid. And Jesus said, so likewise will the father do unto you if you do not from your heart forgive every man his trespass. Now, most people think that the man had to go back and, and pay a debt to the king. We thank God this morning that once God's forgiven your debt, it's wiped out. And I don't owe God anything, nothing. Why? Well, Jesus paid my debt. Um, where God's concerned, I'm debt free. This is not an obligation of debt. It, it's a willingness of heart. I don't have to. I want to. But the debt that had to be paid in Matthew 18 was this. The debt that had to be paid was that the debt of forgiveness to the fellow servant. If God forgives me, then I owe you forgiveness. If God blesses me, I owe you blessing. See, my debt is this way. It's to you. So you want to learn to deal with people the way God deals with you so that you can always operate and you're on the, you're on the uh, defense and you're already prepared and postured and you're always moving forward and not getting caught by surprise. People will offend you. Offense, Jesus said it this way. It's impossible that offenses will come. If you're married, offense will come. And Teresa said, Amen. <laughs> If you're married, offenses will come. If you have children, they're older, offenses will come. If you have a pet, offenses will come. Every once in a while, our little dog Daisy, she'll do something. And Teresa got on her last night. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No. She just looks. You deal with people. You have a job. Offense will come. So we're learning how to forgive before offense comes. You don't want offense in you. Keep it out of you. Learn to walk in love. I'm going to forgive you because God forgave me. I'm going to love you because God loves me first. And when I love because God loves me, then I cease to be moved by what people do and say. Now, that being said, building out of that, this is the word of the Lord after he's taught us how to deal with people based on what God has dealt with us, how God has blessed us. So here in James 5, 7, Be patient, therefore, brethren, to the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it, until he receives the early and latter rain. So God Almighty is waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. And he's not moved by what happens in the earth. God is not moved by need. He's moved by what he believes. 
Now, God moved by need one time, and on the cross, Jesus met every need that day. When he bore every man's sin, every man's curse, and got up from the dead, God moved by need and met every man's need. But God is waiting for something, and he's pretty patient. Now, watch this. See, God is patient. He says, be patient, brethren, to the coming of the Lord. God is patient in verse 7. Be also patient. So as God is patient, you become patient. Papa said, I'm no doctor, but I know when I'm losing my patience. I've used that line many times. I may not be a doctor, but I know when I'm losing my patience. Be also patient and establish your heart for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering and affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy, blessed, and fortunate. We count them joyful, which endure. And that's what this is about, is endurance. I didn't get in this for a week, a month, a year. I got in this to serve God all my life. I started at 17 years old. I've been doing this full-time 43 years. We're celebrating at conference. I'll be finishing 43 years of full-time ministry. I'm more excited about it now than I was then, and I'm just getting started. Most people who've done something 43 years full-time are ready to retire. I'm ready to refire. I'm ready to go forward. We count them happy, which endure, so I've endured. If nothing else, I've proven I'm no quitter. And endure. You've heard of the patience of Job. Now watch this. And seeing the end of the Lord. That's very important. When most people study the book of Job, which we'll look at for a moment this morning, they don't look at the end of the book. They get caught up in the beginning and the middle and miss the end of the book. But here he tells you, you've seen the end of the Lord. Look at how God dealt with Job through patience at the end of the book. That the Lord is pitiful and of tender mercy. So that's as far as I'll go in my reading this morning. Let's believe God for his word to open unto us. So this morning, the first thing you see here is you see the harvest. God has a mind for harvest. Now, God had a seed, Adam, and he planted him in a garden. And because Adam had a will, the seed turned against God or turned away from God. And God said in Jeremiah 2.21, you want to write that down, Jeremiah 2.21, how are you become a degenerate vine unto me? Adam was planted, and God says there to Adam in Jeremiah 2.21, I planted you holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, I planted you holy, a right vine unto me. How then are you become a degenerate vine? So when God planted man in the garden, he was a right vine. But through an act of disobedience and high treason, by his own will, he became a degenerate vine. And everything in Adam is degenerating. If your health is degenerating, it's going backwards. You're losing health. If your finances are degenerating, they're going backwards. So everything in Adam is degenerate, but God unwilling to leave things in that state or condition, God unwilling sent Jesus the second seed or the second Adam. And he planted him in a garden tomb and raised him from the dead, and now there's a new vine. And Jesus said, I'm the vine, and you are the branches. So if Adam is a degenerative vine, Jesus has to be a regenerative vine. So everything in Christ is going back the way God intended it to be. So I want to thank God, I'm in the vine, and I'm a branch, and my life is regenerating. My health is regenerating. My finances are regenerating. My mind is regenerating. My righteousness is regenerating. Everything is going back the way God intended it to go. That's powerful. So God planted the seed of Christ with one thing in mind. He had one son that came through the womb of the Virgin Mary that was God, became, became and become as man. And through that one seed he planted with one thing in mind, a farmer plants for harvest. God has harvest in mind. And the early and the latter rain. So God looks at humanity and he doesn't see broken, crying, dying, sighing humanity. What God sees is lift up your eyes, the fields are white. He sees them white unto harvest. He sees harvest. Everybody he looks at, he sees harvest. 
So we look at the earth and we see pain and tragedy and suffering and misery and all the things that are going on in the earth realm, and it can be very frightening. But lift up your eyes, look to Him and see what He sees. He sees harvest. So Peter was standing on the rooftop in Acts chapter 10. And uh, the Bible said he became hungry, and while being hungered, he fell in a trance. He had a vision. And God showed him a sheet coming down from heaven. Now, the sheet represents the bed or where God rests. These sheets are put on a bed. And so God took the sheet off his bed where he rests. God rests in the finished work of Christ. And he took that sheet and let it down, four corners which speak of God wrapping the whole earth in his rest because he reconciled every man to himself. And then he showed Peter all these animals that according to the law was unclean. And he said, Peter, rise, kill and eat. And Peter said, not so, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. And then God said to him, that which I have called clean, do not call common. And it wasn't about your diet. It wasn't about the natural law. It was about that God had taken the unclean and cleansed through the cross. And all they need to do is receive Jesus. And he said, now, when these men came to Peter and said, we want you to come to Cornelius' house, they were Italians, then Peter had a revelation to go because God had already done a work for the Italians, and that's how the door opened to the Gentiles. By that vision and by Peter going. So God has harvest in mind. So if God has harvest in mind, we should have harvest in mind. We should always be concerned about the lost and the hurting and the broken that are outside of Christ. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he will send labors into the field. Now, I pray that, but I'm willing to go. Now, some people couldn't go because of physical limitations. I pray that, and then I say, Lord, send me. So every day and every way we're concerned about the harvest. You see the heart of God. He has mercy. He has patience. And he has the heart of a father even towards those that are lost, those that are hurting, those that are broken. Thank God he's not willing that any should perish. Thank God that Christ died for all. And thank God he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Thank God he has a heart for the harvest and he's not going to waver or change his mind. He has harvest in mind. So if God has harvest in mind, you and I should have harvest in mind. Now, I want you to think with me just for a moment about where we live in Lancaster, South Carolina. I came here 28 years ago, and this was a sleepy little southern town. And there was a lot of resistance to any growth. But right now in our city, within a seven to eight mile radius of this church, no more than 10, they're building 2,400 new homes. 2,400 new homes are being built within a seven-mile radius. Across the street from Arrowwood, where I live, if you go to University Drive, where Arrowwood connects, they're building 700 homes. They've tore all that land down, and they've already started, and Ryan Holmes is coming in there to build 700 new homes right there, and that's as close as I live. Now, I know that God doesn't want this church to have all those 2,400 families. But I do know that God would want us to have 1% would be what? Just 24 families. We have to start thinking about harvest. We have to start thinking about being prepared for what God wants to send us. See, he's waiting. I've been waiting for a long time. I've been praying, prophesying that God's adding families and people that will come, that we can be a blessing to them. They'll be a blessing to us. New family, new friends, new fellowship. This church is going to radically shift, but we need to be prepared for that. You see, it doesn't just happen because if you just wait till it happens, then it will never happen. So we have to prepare our heart. God is waiting for something. We patiently waited for the harvest. So there are 2,400 new homes right there within seven to eight miles of this house that are being built. And some of those families belong to Open Door. So God is preparing my heart and our heart for a harvest to come. I've been praying for a long time. The day will come when these altars are filled every service with somebody getting born again for the first time. And I appreciate people who've been away from the Lord who come back, backsliders, get back to God. Thank God for that. But I want to see people get saved, don't you? And most churches in our city don't see people get saved. I could tell you a story about my home church. Well, my home church, Pastor Stevens came there when I was just real small and, uh, in 1968. And he began to preach and nothing happened for about two years. He labored, he loved people, but nothing happened. We had a trumpet player named Howard Long come. And he started on a Sunday morning. 
And he started preaching, and Brother Stevens had sown for two years. He had sown and waited patiently, and Howard Long, he wasn't a great preacher. He could just, you know, he preached about 20, 25 minutes. He's an evangelist. And he played the trumpet and sang, and the first Sunday morning, three or four people came, got brand new saved, very encouraging. That Sunday night, three or four more. We went 21 days. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Sunday school, Monday through Saturday night. And during that revival, there was about 80, 75 to 80 people that got saved. Brand new. And out of that 75 to 80 people, about 70 of them received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and were filled with the Spirit, spake with tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. And out of that, those 70 people joined our church. And we went from 100 to 170 just that quick. And from that point on, since Howard Long left, we went two years, two years, and they had somebody saved every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, and they had somebody saved every revival service or special service we had. And these were not repeats. These are not people that had come and gone. These were brand new people. I saw a gentleman named Brother Thomas. He came in, him and his family. And uh, he got saved on a Sunday night, and he went to the altar, and, and what the old-timers called pray through the old-time salvation. And he got born again, and uh, he got up, and he said, I've got something I've got to do. I, because we, we were in revival when he got saved on Sunday night. He said, I've got something I've got to do. And he said, I want you all to pray for me. And he wouldn't tell us what it was. But he had been stealing from his construction site. And he went home and wrapped up those tools he'd been stealing, put them in a blanket, took them to his boss the next morning, and said, Jesus saved me last night. Here's what I've stolen from you. And if you need to call the police or put me in jail, you do what you need to do. But I want things right with God, and I'm sorry, and I repent, and I want to I want to be a blessing to you, and I will not steal anymore because Jesus saved me. Now, when people start doing that, that's real conversion. A lot of people, you see them come to the altar, but there's no impact or no change. When you really get saved, this will change your world. It'll make such a difference. You have to look in the mirror, and you won't even recognize yourself when you really get born again. I'm persuaded we got some people in the church that just came to the altar. They never really got born again. You don't get born again by coming to the altar. You get an experience with Jesus. He comes in. And when Jesus changes you, I know myself, third Sunday in May, 1979, I knelt down, I, I knelt down a sinner, I stood up a saint, and I got up, and I couldn't even, I didn't recognize myself. When I started, I started looking in the mirror, I looked different, I felt different, everything was different. When you really get born again, when you let Jesus come in your heart, when you get born again, you will be radically altered from the DNA of who you were meant to be. You'll get changed, washed in the blood, sanctified, I'm expecting harvest, how about you? So you see the, the patience and the mercy of God in harvest. So we've waited, but our harvest time is quickly coming. Again, just think with me, 2,400 new homes are being built within a seven-mile, eight-mile radius of this house. And that's probably not all of them. If you go a little further back up 521, there's more being built. 2,400 homes. They're expecting people to come into the city over the next five years and double the population. We need to be ready for harvest. We need to have harvest on mind. So at least, if nothing else, we're praying the Lord send labors into the harvest field. And I want us as a church to be prepared to contact every home, to be able to make sure that they know we're here, that we're here to serve people. We love people. I mean, I like to take them. I like to take 2,400 gift baskets out of here and put it on every door of people that are moving in. I mean, something good in a gift basket, about open door and about what we can bless them with, and then some chocolate chip cookies. Hallelujah. You know, people like chocolate chip cookies. They'll come if you give them cookies. <laughs> something about cookies. They like chocolate chip cookies. I know people will come if you give them cookies. <laughs> so he says, be patient. Look at God. Look at the Lord. Look at how he's waited all this time and put up with all this stuff. But he's waited for something. He's waiting for harvest. He's got harvest in mind. And, of course, he could see the end from the beginning. And he knows, so we have to have harvest in mind with his vision. So I pray God give me a harvest mindset. God loves people. And I know primarily church is not for sinners. You do realize that. You know that, right? Because we come into church and we're singing about somebody they don't know. We're excited about somebody they don't know. We're, we're excited about somebody that they don't trust him because they don't know him. And we stand up too long. We sing too long. <laughs> we preach too long. Not for the saints, just for the sinners. Amen? Not for the saints, just for the sinners. The saints say, preach on, Pastor John. Preach on, Pastor John. 
Preach it, Pastor John. Give us some more, Pastor John. The sinners say, dear God, is this guy ever going to shut up? My God, it's 12 o'clock. I'm hungry. i got to get to the steakhouse. And especially, especially if you've got a guy that's worked all week, and then he comes to church somehow on a Sunday, and he doesn't know Jesus, he stands up too long, and he says, and he said, I'm so bored. And he knows, especially if he's a sports nut, NFL kicks off at 1 o'clock. I expect to get my dinner to be home. I want to be there for the kickoff. Panthers are playing now. I want to be there for the kickoff. That's the way sinners think. Are you listening? Sinners think that way. You and I don't think that way. We come to church with an expectation. We come to church with an excitement. We come to church because we're believing to meet Him. We come to church to see one another because we want to hear the good things of God. We're coming to church because we have expectation. We come early and excited and expected because we're expecting something to happen because where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of them. But God wants us to prepare for harvest. God's got mercy for the harvest, and he sees open door, and he sees us at the end of our journey, and he sees a lot more people here, but we have to get ready. So God is doing the work. People are moving into the city, but we have to prepare our hearts to be ready. So will you begin to pray with me starting today? Lord, prepare us to reap the harvest. Up to this point, we've spent time building the body. We've anchored the church. We've got a good foundation. We've got a strong foundation. We've got our property paid for. We're ready. We just need to be prepared for the harvest. You have to be open to receive the harvest. And somehow, some way, my home church, with all those people coming in, everybody adapted and adjusted. And that church from 1970 to 1975 grew like that and continued to grow like that. And it grew from 100 to Easter Sunday, 1975. We had 545 people in a building that would seat 300. See, I was a part of that growing up, watching that. And they didn't have near the revelation we have. They couldn't sing like we sang. They didn't know the revelation. And they sure enough couldn't open the Bible like we can. And they did not know the Bible was about Jesus. They'd pick a message and preach a message and preach another. And they had all different subjects. And it was all like a jigsaw puzzle nobody could put together. We we're all just trying to find our way. But we have the revelation of Jesus Christ. We are much more prepared. We're prepared to minister to people on a spiritual level, but you have to be ready because people have needs and they need us to touch their needs. So you see that James said, be patient. Look at God who's waiting for the early and latter rain and he's not going to, he's not going to yield. He's not going to buckle or change until he sees the early and latter rain. So let's believe with God. Let's believe with him. Let's just trust him and believe with him. Then number two, you see the hope of the church here. He said, the Lord is at hand. And uh, so he tells you about the coming of the Lord. The coming of the Lord draws nigh. Now, there's a lot of controversy about the coming of the Lord. I just want to say this. I believe in the coming of the Lord. I've studied all the ologies. You know, there's soteriology and there's eschatology. And eschatology is the study of end-time things. I believe the Old Covenant ended in 70 A.D. I believe the last days, oftentimes the Bible speaks of, happened in 70 A.D. But I also believe the New Covenant doesn't have an end. It has a transition. And we all know that the creation has not been changed. Romans 8, 19 through 26 will tell you the creature has to be liberated. And that creation out there is not changed. We had a rising up of war over in the Middle East this week. Israel has declared war. So we know the creation has not been changed. And we know, and I personally believe, that God has called us to the fourth dimension of everything. I believe there are four dimensions in God. And so there was the first coming of the Lord, which was from the womb of Mary. Do you believe He came? you believe He came? And the second coming of the Lord was from the tomb. He left for three days, and He came back. If I leave Lancaster for three days and come back, Jesus came from the tomb. I believe He's alive this morning. But I also believe the Lord came in here this morning because He came in you. I believe Jesus is coming fresh. I believe He lives in us. I believe Jesus Christ lives in you. But I also believe that He's going to leave and come from that dimension into this dimension. Acts chapter 3 will tell you that the heavens must contain Him until the restoration of all things spoken by the mouth of His holy prophets. So we're not there yet, but there is a transition going on. And you and I have the right, and we have this hope. And the Bible keeps talking about hope that saves us. Romans 8, 23, and not only they, but we ourselves do groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. Listen to Romans 8, 24. We are saved by hope. Now that's different because Paul said we're saved by faith, but he also said we're saved, same word, healed, delivered by hope. John, 1 John chapter uh, chapter, it's chapter 3, verse 3, said every man that hath this hope purifies himself. 
And this is that hope. We're saved by hope. But a man does not wait for what he hopes for because if he waits for what he hopes for, he says, listen, if you're hoping for something you've already got, you don't hope for it anymore. But if you hope for that which you have not, then you with patience. There it is again. You with patience hope for it. So there needs to be a restored, renewed idea that he came from the womb, he came from the tomb, and he's coming you, but he is appearing in this dimension. And I fully expect to see Jesus with these eyes, glorified, but I expect to see him. Does that excite you to know that you're going to see the Redeemer? Job said it this way, I know, I know my Redeemer lives, and though the, skin, though the worms eat my skin, I will in my body see God. Now that's faith. And Job's been dead a long time, but Job said, I will with my eyes see God. I believe in the coming of the Lord. A lot of people have done away with that, or they believe he came on the day of Pentecost, and that's it. But I believe in the coming of the Lord, and we have this hope. And a lot of people have lost their hope. They don't have any hope. The new covenant is going to transition. This is not all there is, beloved. God is going to set things right. This creation is going to be completely restored. Everything that has been will be set back because God put everything in the regenerative vine. And thank God, it's going to be restored. God's a God of restoration. He's not leaving that creation out there with tornado and hailstorms and hurricanes and, and, and blizzards and things that kill humanity. That's just the anger of the earth against fallen, broken humanity. But Jesus came to set that right. And I believe in the restoration of creation. I believe it is coming. I thank God for that. So you have this hope. And 1 John 3 says, Then we shall see him as he is. And every man that has his hope purifies himself. So I've got some hope in me today, and I'm saved by hope. And a lot of reason people don't have any salvation working much is they've lost their hope. I thank God for the coming of the Lord, don't you? Thank God for the coming of the Lord. Now, I grew up in Fred Sanford theology. How many of you know what that is? All right, let me go a little further. How many of you know what Fred Sanford, who Fred Sanford was? You remember that? Fred Sanford, everything that happened, he grabbed his chest and say, this is the big one. And I grew up in that theology that everything that happened, this is it. Jesus be here for nightfall. And, and we <laughs> everything that happened. This, Fred Sanford go, oh, Elizabeth, I'm coming to join you. This is it. This is a bit. I'm, I'm the one coming. This is it. It's over. I grew up in that theology. And I know better than that now. I know that God's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. So I'm looking at that fruit of the earth through his eyes. But I do believe in the appearing of the Lord. I believe he's appearing in me. And I believe he will step out of that dimension into this dimension and make everything right. Do you believe that? Because surely, to goodness, you're watching my internet and you believe that other stuff. Please, just think a moment. Read Romans 8, 19 through 26. Please understand, the creation has not been restored. It's not been liberated from the bondage of Adam. It is corrupted. It is struggling. And it needs help. But you and I are here to do something about the earth while we're here, are we not? Because there's a river flowing out of us that will change creation. You believe that? So all that's working together for our good. Amen? Third thing this morning is this. He says, your heart, he says, listen, I want you to understand how to establish your heart. Establish your heart. God doesn't want you going up and down. He wants you established in the Word. He wants your heart established. He wants you to have your heart established. God wants to establish my heart with grace and patience. He said, be ye also patient. So God wants to give you some serious patience so that you don't waver. Now, there's a lot of things I made it not, may not be, but I am consistent. I'm consistent. Every morning when I get up, I want to go to prayer. First thing I want to do, I want to go to prayer. I'm consistent. I want to read my Bible every day. I'm consistent. I, I want to be in the house of God. I'm consistent. I'm consistent. I exercise six days a week. I'm consistent. God's given me that. I'm thankful. There's some people so sporadic, it's just hard to watch them live. They, they go and they come and they're just always sporadic. But God wants you to be patient. To be patient means you're consistent. Can I have a good amen? I think I'm knocking the shout out of you on a Sunday morning. God wants you to be patient. And he says, establish your heart and be patient. Be patient this morning. So God wants you to be consistent. I'm consistent with my finances. I'm consistent with my life. I want to learn to be patient and consistent before God. And Paul prayed in Colossians 1 that God would strengthen you under all patience. And I look at that, all patience. God is so patient, so consistent, and I want that same consistency in me. He doesn't change, and thank God I don't want to change. I want to be like Him. He's not going up and down. Thank God He's not. Thank God He's not going. Thank God He's not mad today, and then glad tomorrow, and mad today, and then glad tomorrow. Thank God He's not that way. Thank God He's patient. 
And James tell you there, he's patient. Again, in chapter 117 of James, he's consistent. There's no variable, there's neither shadow of turning with the Lord. He's patient. And I don't care what you're doing, whether it's business, it's church, it's walking with God, it's working out. It doesn't matter. The most important part of your life is consistency. There's nothing that will ever work if you don't learn to be consistent. Won't do you any good whatsoever to read your Bible all day today and then lay it down for six months and pick it up again. That won't help you. But a little bit every day over six months will add to some great dividend in six months from now. Wouldn't do you a bit of good to go to the gym this afternoon and work out and get sore and then not go back till next year. That won't help you. That won't help you. Won't do you a bit of good to go on a diet today and eat 500 calories, then tomorrow eat 4,000 calories. That won't help you. Say, I'm going to diet today and then I'll diet again January 1st. That's not going to help you. Consistency. Beloved, God wants you to be consistent in the way you think, the way you believe, the way you talk. He wants you to be consistent. God wants to establish your heart. Then the fourth thing this morning, God wants you to honor the martyrs. And he said, consider the prophets. They suffered, they had affliction, and they were tormented and tortured. Some even put to death, but they endured. So I want to take a moment and honor everybody that's laid their life down for the gospel. You know, we take a day every year and honor people that laid their life down for this country for our freedoms, and we should. Huge sacrifice. Huge sacrifice. My father fought in World War II, and my earthly father was very patriotic. He saw men die. He saw men die. He actually had combat in World War II. He, he fought and was getting ready to go into o o Okinawa there when they were getting ready. I think that's what it was. He was getting ready. To go. He was on a ship ready to go in, and then the war ended. Well, after they dropped the hydrogen bombs, the war ended. But he was right there in World War II. So he saw that. This is very patriotic. But you know, there have been people that suffered and laid their life down for the gospel. You know, Hebrews chapter 11 talks about it this way. It said, and there were some in, in the hall of faith that were tortured and killed, not accepting deliverance. Now hear that. Deliverance was available, but they didn't accept it. There were those who were tortured and killed, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Some people laid down their life because they believed in the resurrection. And then the writer of Hebrews 11 says, and there were those who were mocked, made fun of, criticized. They were scourged, put in prison, of whom the world was not worthy, but God's not ashamed to be called their God. Have you ever been mocked or made fun of for your faith? I've had people laugh me to scorn because of what I believe. I've had people call me everything but a blooming idiot for what I believe. But that's okay. Praise God. If that's all there is, Jesus said, when men speak all evil against you, rejoice and count yourself fortunate for your reward is great in heaven. So thank God. I'm not, I'm not going to be moved by what somebody says about me or doesn't say about me, but I do want to honor those that laid, there are people that laid their life down for the gospel's sake. They laid their life down. We thank God for that. In, jo in the book of James, James tells you, don't forget their suffering and their sacrifice. We've all suffered some affliction because of what they suffered. We've all been there. We've all had attacks over our faith. And then finally this morning, I want you to hear the message of prosperity from the book of Job. I'm going to close this morning by looking at it this way. He said, now I want you to consider the patience of God, the patience of Job, and the end of the Lord in the book of Job. Now, when we look at the book of Job, most of us have only heard the beginning in the middle of the book. The beginning of the book, there was a perfect and an upright man. Now, who do you think that's talking about? It's talking about Jesus. And uh, Job was richly blessed. And when Satan came before God, he said, does Job not fear you for naught? You have blessed him and you kept him. Let the hedge down. And God said, okay, anything you can take, but you can't take his life. So there's some questions there theologically. There's some things we could talk about. Does God permit? Does God not permit? What's our authority? Then Job said, the thing I feared came greatly on me. Remember, the thing I feared came on me. So there's a lot of debate about the book of Job that way. And I can get in the debate and I know some things and I can preach some things. But on either side, there's debate about how God operates. But I'll just say this, that was before Jesus died, that was before the new covenant, that was before there was blood on the mercy seat, and that was before we had the name of Jesus, and that was before that we had the power of the Holy Ghost living in us, and Job didn't know anything about an opposer named the devil. He didn't know anything about that. So I put some things there on your notes. Watch this. First of all, see the oppression of Job. Job suffered a terrible tragedy. First of all, he lost all his possessions. 
Now, just think for a moment. What if you lost every material possession you had? That would put an enormous hardship on you today. If you got home when there was no home, if you didn't have a car, he lost all of his material possessions. All of his wealth was gone. That's huge. But then he lost 10 children in a day. Now, I watch my parents suffer the pain of my sister getting killed when she was 19, coming home from Bible college. And I watch the tears, I watch the pain, the suffering, the hurt, the agony, the torment, that that caused them the rest of their life. That happened on October 25th, 1972. She died at 311, was pronounced dead at 311 on that afternoon in Knoxville, Tennessee, coming home from Lee College. That happened, and the rest of their life, they cared a pain from that. They didn't know how to receive healing by, the, by, by going to Pilate's Judge Mall. They didn't understand it, and I didn't know how to tell them that then. And I know I'm healed of it now because I've been to Pilate's Judge Mall. He bore our emotional wound and pain. Can I have an amen to that? And, and Karen went to be with the Lord. I thank God she was born again, filled with the Spirit. I was there the night she got filled with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost fell. And uh, about four or five teenagers got the Holy Ghost. Karen wonderfully got the Holy Ghost. So I thank God she's with the Lord. And I praise God for that. But, but I watched. But you can imagine just, just one. But how about ten children in a day? So I was fussing with Kristen one night. My mom and dad were visiting. And Krista was little, and Krista was giving me a fit. I know when you look at Krista now, you couldn't imagine that, but she was a little tyrant. She was a tornado when she was little. I mean, boy, she, she could just get, get after it. She was, a, she was a tornado. We call Heidi the tiny tornado. She's kind of like Krista, but Heidi is a tiny tornado. Heidi will just haul off and whop you. She don't care. But, but Krista didn't, wouldn't haul off and hit me, but, boy, she'd rebel. She had an attitude, just an attitude. And I was fussing at her, and my mom pulled me aside and said, now, listen, your daughter's in there in the bed. My daughter is in heaven, but her body's out there in the cemetery. You need to be good to that little girl. And I watched my mom tell me that with tears. She said, your daughter's here. My daughter's in heaven. You need to honor Krista. You need to be good to that little girl. So I went in there and got on my knees beside her bed, said, I want to apologize. I'm sorry. And I was wrong, and I said, let's just love each other. You're my daughter. You're my princess. You're my girl, and I love you. Because my, my mom said, but imagine Job. He's got 10 caskets in one day. 10. 10. Can you imagine? And then on top of that, right after that, he gets smitten with disease from the top of his head to the sole of his feet, and he's sitting there in boils, covered in pain and sorrow. So he said, financial He's had family, and then he's got his health taken away from him. And there he sits in what the Bible calls an ash heap, rubbing ashes on himself, trying to get relief, and there's no medical help for him. And that's some serious suffering. So just for a moment, look at, look at the opposition that Job faced. That's enormous suffering. None of us have ever come near that. You've been hurt. I've been hurt. We've been hurt. There's been some pain and tragedy, but none of us have ever come near that. So the book of James here said, I want you to consider Job and consider the end of the book of Job. So the first part of Job is his oppression. And we draw there a parallel to Jesus' offering of himself. Jesus was a perfect and an upright man. And Jesus submitted to a judgment that was unfair. And it wasn't right that Jesus, the righteous, should suffer sin. It wasn't right that he should suffer fear. It wasn't right that he should be made diseased. It wasn't right. But on that cross, he offered himself. Why? For you, for me, for us. He offered himself. He suffered. See, he is our heavenly Job. So whenever I study the book of Job, I remember there was a man named Job, and yes, he suffered in this realm, and I remember suffering could come, but there's a greater than Job here. Come on, shout with me this morning. Just a few more minutes. There's a greater than Job here. There's a greater than Job here. There's a greater than Job. And Jesus hung on that cross and bore my judgment, took my curse, took what I was, and Jesus suffered. And his suffering was far greater than Job's suffering. And when preachers preach on the book of Job, they magnify Job instead of Jesus. And we never magnify anybody above Jesus. Jesus got to be first. We've all suffered, but our sufferings don't compare to his suffering. For he didn't just suffer mine, he suffered yours and mine and ours. And together, he suffered it all, he bore it all. So Jesus on that cross, just for a moment, made a curse, made sin, bore what we were, took what we were. And, and so I can say now, Job said, the thing I feared fell on me. I can say the thing that I was afraid of fell on Jesus on the cross. I've got an advantage over Job. I can look back to the cross and what I feared fell on Jesus. If you're afraid of sickness, it fell on Christ. If you're afraid of sin, it fell on Christ. If you're afraid of fear, it fell on Christ. You're free today. Thank God you can have some freedom because your heavenly Job hung on a tree to deliver you and set you free. Praise God. But then we go to the end of the book of Job. The outcome of the overcomer. The outcome. And see, James tells you here, consider the end of Job. 
the end. Don't just, don't just stop at the beginning because people, religious people especially, will argue with you. Well, you know, I'm just like Job. The Lord's doing this and the Lord's doing it. I'm just like Job. And you're not perfect and upright, so you're probably just not like Job. I read that Job was a perfect and upright man. I said, well, no, he ain't talking about me. That didn't take long to figure that out. I could have figured that out in my own carnal mind. If you're talking about perfect and upright, I mean, that's a high qualification. Perfect and upright? Well, I know he ain't talking about me. That had to be talking about Jesus. I'm like Paul got a thorn in the flesh. Paul got a thorn in the flesh for the abundance of revelation. And everybody I've had that ever told me that didn't have no revelation. <laughs> the end of Job. What was the end of Job? And I like Job 42.10. Listen to it. Come on, we're going to shout here. We've got about five more minutes. And the Lord, aren't you glad? And there's still and the Lord. You may be hurting today, but and the Lord. And the Lord turned, the Lord turned the captivity of Job. Come on, let's shout this morning. The Lord turned the captivity of Job. James told me to consider the end. The end of Job wasn't to sit on a, on a sick bed for the rest of his life with his family lost and with everything and his wife telling him to curse God and die. That's not the end of Job. That's not the end. James said, consider the end. The end was the Lord turned his captivity. Come on, let's let God turn your captivity this morning. Will you do that with me right now? Just receive your, your captivities being turned. Right now, in the name of Jesus, he's working something. Your captivity's being turned. You don't have to say where you are like you are. The Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. And of all the people that you want to call friends, those three that came to Job, boy, they were, they were no help at all. Those three friends, you know what they remind me of? A shark at a shipwreck. You know, the last thing you want to happen in a shipwreck is for sharks to show up. And Job's sitting there, and these three friends come. And when you read the book of Job, they accuse him and accuse him and accuse him and accuse him and accuse him. And God had to come to them and to Eliphaz and say, You have not spoken right concerning me nor my servant Job. You told him that you didn't speak right concerning me. So we've all had Job's comforters, haven't we? I remember when I got sick with the pancreatitis, I was laying in the hospital, I had a man come in there, and he said, Well, the Lord said this is your diet that did this. Thank you. That was real encouraging. First of all, and you know, that made me mad. I have to admit it, that made me mad. First of all, I've worked out since I was a teenager, and my diet wasn't perfect. By the way, yours ain't either. Before you look at me with a religious tone of voice. <laughs> but I started thinking about people that had a horrible diet compared to mine, and their pancreases didn't blow up. And that man come in the room and just put that condemnation on me and tried to make, oh, this is all your fault. You're in a sick bed. It's all your fault. It's all your fault. See, if you'd ate better, you wouldn't be here. And then I had people make fun of me and say things like, yeah, that healing gospel you preach, how's it working now for you, Cahill? How's it working? You, you went around teaching healing schools all over the country. You tell everybody God raised your son up and healed your son. How's that healing working for you now? You're in a sickbed 45 days. You look like death warmed over. You're going to end up a diabetic. That's what they, they made fun of me. I had actual preachers mock me for the healing gospel. But just come on, consider the end. Come on, consider the end. I'm nine years and six months out of a deathbed and a sick bed. I'm not a diabetic. I don't have pancreatitis. My pancreas is working. I don't have an insulin pump. I don't have a mechanical pancreas. I'm not on one medication today. Consider the end of the matter. See, that's where we fall short. You don't consider the end. It's not over. That's what I'm trying to tell you. It's not over yet. Don't you dare give up. Be patient. The Lord turned the captivity of Job. He turned his captivity when Job prayed for his friends. Now, listen to me. It's very important. Sometimes your captivity turns by how you pray for others. Sometimes you need to get your mind off yourself and pray for somebody else. Sometimes you need to pray for other people. Sometimes it may be praying for that person that's hurt you or the one that's spoken evil of you. Job's captivity turned when he prayed for his friends and the Lord gave Job double, twice as much. Well, I'm going to shout this morning. You don't get a double portion. You don't get a double portion. You get what Jesus got. And he didn't get a double portion. He got it all. Come on, let's shout. It's time to shout. It's about time to go. Let's shout. You don't get a double portion. 
Elijah walked in a great measure of the Spirit, and it was doubly proportioned over to Elisha. But Elisha ended up dying sick, melancholy, sad, and frustrated and angry, and he got mad at a king and died and didn't take his anointing on and pass it on to that king. And he took that power to the grave. That's what happened to the double portion. God doesn't want you walking in the double portion. He wants you to walk as an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. Come on. I feel like jumping up and down. You're an heir of God, a joint heir with Christ. He got it all back. Jesus got it all back. And God, the Father, turned the captivity of Jesus when he raised him from the dead. And Jesus prayed for his friends. And you and I, he calls us friends. And so he got it all back, and you become an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. And he got ten more children, and he got his finances back, and he got his health back, and God restored to him. <laughs> and I'm hearing the Holy Ghost say, And the Lord will restore unto you the years, the palmer worm, the locust, the canker worm, and the caterpillar have eaten away. This is not good. It's 1230 and I feel the preach sneaking up on me. This is not good. Real quick. Come on, preach, Pastor John. Come on, here we go. The vegetation would come up in Israel in their harvest fields. And the palmer worm that was an enemy in four stages. This happens to every believer. The palmer worm comes and takes the top of the vegetation off. That represents your dream. I'm, I'm hearing the Holy Ghost say, I want to restore some dreams. I want to restore dreams. Some of you have laid down your dreams. I want to restore your dream. Then the locusts would come and eat the stalk. And the stalk represents your discipleship upon which the dream is built. Because if you don't develop discipleship in an area, your dream will never come to pass. And then once the dream and the discipleship are gone, then the canker worm would crawl on the ground and he would eat what's left of the foliage or the leaves. And that represents your desire. So Satan systematically dismantles God's people by taking your dream your discipleship, your desire, and then the caterpillar would come after they finished and go under the earth and he would eat the seed, which where your destiny is, is in the seed. Your destiny is in the seed. So that it looks like this. Satan takes the dream, the discipline, the desire, and then the destiny in the seed. But even if your adversary got your seed, God's got more seed. Two more minutes. Help me preach right here. God's got more seed. It's not over, beloved. Consider the end of Job. Can you imagine what Job must have thought when he's sitting there looking at ten kids? He's looking at his finances doubled, and he's looking at his health restored, and he's thinking, I remember that, but God is a good God. Can you imagine how much goodness was in his heart toward God? I remember where I was, but God's a good God. I'm healthy now. He's restored my finances. He restored my family. He's restored my business. He's restored. God is a God of restoration. It's not over, beloved. It's not over. The Lord turned the captivity of Job. Psalms 37, 37. Mark the end of the perfect man. Behold the upright, for his end is shalom. Psalms 37, 37, one of my favorite verses. Who's the perfect man? Jesus. So he said, Mark, what are we pressing toward? The mark of the high calling of God in Christ. The perfect man's Jesus. He's in the throne. Good news. He didn't tell you to be the perfect man. He told you to mark the perfect man. That's good. So mark the perfect man. Behold the upright and look. Behold the end of that man. He said, consider the end of Job, but greater than Job is here. Consider the end of Jesus. Where's Jesus? Look at him for a moment hanging on that tree. Look at that suffering. Look at that pain. Look at that unrecognizable mass of human flesh heaving up and down, dying your death, bearing your curse. Look at that. But then go from there and look at the throne. He's not on a cross today. He's not heaving. He's not broken or beaten or bludgeoned. He's reigning in sovereign, omnipotent, majestic, reigning glory. He's king of kings, Lord of lords. Jesus reigns. Consider the end of the perfect man. Mark the end. Don't just look at the cross. Mark the end. And as far as the east is from the west, the east would represent the cross. The cross. Look at that. The east from the west. I mean, you can't get any further apart than what happened on the cross and what's in the throne. That's as far as you can go. There's no more dichotomy than that. He bore everything bad on the cross. He is everything good in the throne. He was made sin on the cross. He's righteous in the throne. He had death on the cross, but he's alive forever in the throne. It's done, beloved. Consider the end of that man. And you're an heir of God, joined heir with Christ. But then Jeremiah 29, 11 says this. It said, now, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. 
You know, God's thinking about you today. I know the thoughts I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. Now, here's the problem. God knows the thoughts he's thinking about you, but you don't know the thoughts he's thinking about you. That's what the Bible's for. The Bible's filled with his thoughts. He said, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, my ways than your ways. So he sent his word down to us to water our mind, water the garden of the soul so we know what he thinks. The Bible is what God thinks about you. To do what? To give you an expected end. See, God's got an expected end for you. And that end is to stand in Christ, spirit, soul, and body, glorified forever eternally. And we're on that journey now from glory to glory, faith to faith in Jesus' name. All he's telling us to do is prepare for harvest. Let the hope of the coming of the Lord abide in your heart. Establish your heart this morning. Honor those that have suffered and sacrificed before you. And then come this morning and just know this. Hear the prosperity. Consider the end of Job. Don't just stop in the middle. Don't just stop at his test or trial. It may be tough right now. It may be hard. You might be oppressed and depressed and suffering right now. But it's not over, beloved. Come on, stand with me in Jesus' name so I know it's time to quit. I think back to when I suffered clinical depression. Teresa was with me. We got married in 81. And uh, so in uh, 80, 87, we, we had that religious run-in with that man I told you about last week. The Lord told me to forgive. We had a religious run-in with that man and his family and all those people in that church. And I, that was my first run-in with religion. And I, I went under the weight of depression. I sank under clinical depression. I was on medication. I, could, I couldn't do anything. My mind was just completely destroyed. I just, I just couldn't function. It was hard to get out of the chair. It was hard to get out. I didn't want to get up. I didn't want to eat. I didn't want to take a shower. I just wanted to just, just lay there and die. I was there. But this morning, I remember he lifted. Listen to what David said. I remember he lifted me out of a horrible pit. Some of you need to take a moment before you go and remember some of the places you've been in times past. I'm going to tell you now, if it wasn't for the Lord on your side, you'd be dead. If it wasn't for the Lord on your side, you wouldn't be here this morning. You might be in jail. You'd be on the other side of eternity. But he lifted you out of a horrible pit. He raised you up. He had mercy on you. He put your feet on a solid rock. He put, he put a new song in your mouth. And today I'm singing praise to God. He's my God, my strength, and my song. He put a new song in my mouth, and I'm going to let his praise be continually in my mouth. He's God Almighty. Consider the end of Job. Yeah, Job had some problems as bad as it gets on this side of eternity, but God didn't leave him there, and God ain't going to leave you there. Listen to me. God didn't leave him there. James said, consider the end of Job. Consider the end of it. Look at the end of the Lord. The Lord was merciful to Job. And if he's got mercy for Job, he's got more mercy for you because we're on the other side of the cross. So what you need is mercy today. Amen? All right, bow your heads with me, if you will, and pray for the Internet family. Now, this morning, I want to talk to you just a moment. Maybe may be tough where you are. It may be difficult, but I want to encourage you. Consider the end of Job. God brought him out of the sickness and healed his body. There's healing. God restored his family. And brought ten, and the three daughters of Job were the fairest in the land, Job 42. Those three girls that God gave him, fairest in the land. The Bible said there was none as fair as the daughters of Job. Beautiful children, ten restored, and then his finances doubled. So God has something for you right now. I just We're praying a release for you right now, restoration for you in the name of Jesus. Dreams lost, restored. Discipleship lost, restored. Desire lost, restored. God, stir your heart of passion, and finally, destiny restored in the name of Jesus. Restored by the power of God right now in Jesus' name. And we love you and bless you. This week, thank you for your love and prayer and sowing. We appreciate you. We're partners with you in Jesus' name. Be encouraged in the Lord. Establish your heart. Be patient and be encouraged. And just know this. Consider the end of Job. Your end is a revelation of Jesus manifested in you. God bless you. We love you in Jesus' name. We'll see you Wednesday, if not before.